When you watch television and you see what is known as Christian TV, sometimes it is incredibly embarrassing. Not only because the uh, teachers are oftentimes false teachers, not all the time, but many of them are, but in addition to that, everything has to do with how can I get God to help me? How can I have a spiritual breakthrough? How can I work it so that God will give me money or so that he will give me good health? That's the great emphasis. And usually it is, if you send us money, you'll get all these blessings. You'll overcome God's reluctance, and thanks to us, you'll get what you want. This message is almost the opposite of that. It's not going to be what we can get from God, but what we can give to God. And in the process, thank you for that support. And what we can give to God, and in turn, we will be blessed. But we don't give this in order to be blessed, but we will be blessed in ways that will be transforming. I have no doubt that as a result of this message, there are going to be those whose lives are going to be changed, possibly forever, if they ever grasp what it is that we'll be speaking about, and that is the whole idea of worship and what it is. In its most basic form, worship is ascribing worth to God. It is giving God his due. It is living, recognizing that God is the most valuable object in the universe. And by object, I don't mean that he is impersonal. I mean that he has the most value, surpasses all other values, and it's all about him, and it's not about us. But one of the great things that concerns me is that we limit worship. We think that worship is a matter of place. We worship in church. Well, we do worship in church. And when you come to the Moody Church on a Sunday morning, just know that we as a worship committee met this past week to discuss the various hymns, to discuss the worship, because we want to do all that we can to help people to leave the mundane, to come here with one mind, one heart, and to worship God. And there's something that happens corporately, oftentimes that does not happen individually. But, limit, but worship should not be limited to where it is. It should not be limited to a specific time. It should not be limited to a specific ritual. Sometimes rituals can be very empty. I'm reminded of the five-year-old boy who was taken to church and who prayed that evening, Oh God, we had a wonderful time in church. I sure wish you were there. <laughs> so what we want to do is to encounter God. Now here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to give you four or five gifts that we're going to give to God. And then we'll see why this is so transforming. Not only is God honored, but we are changed and changed permanently. You may have come here with a huge need, relationally, spiritually. You may be going through a trial that no one else can really understand. But as a result of understanding worship and actually doing it, your life can be transformed. Well, I'm going to ask you to turn to several passages, and uh, as we are accustomed to say, if you have a Bible, there is a Bible there in the seat in front of you, in the congregation here. And if you have your iPad and cell phone and you have your Bible on it, uh, please turn to the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, the first gift we're going to give to God today is our bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. There it is. We give our bodies to God. Notice the imagery that is in this passage is that of the priesthood. In the Old Testament, the priest brought sacrifices to God, and only the priest could bring sacrifices to God. But in the New Testament era, because all of us are priests, we all now exercise the priestly office of bringing a sacrifice to God. 
And the first sacrifice I'm listing today is that of our bodies. We bring our bodies to God. Notice that Paul urges this based upon the mercies of God, the love of God, the grace of God, the fact that God shares his righteousness with us, the fact that God chose us and drew us to himself. Paul is saying, and all of that, of course, is in the previous chapters of the book of Romans, Paul is saying, in light of all of these undeserved mercies, let me plead with you, let me beseech you, to give your bodies to God. Now, he's speaking to believers, and if you are a believer in Christ, you already have a soul within you that has been redeemed. And this soul already, in a sense, belongs to God. But he's saying now we have to bring our bodies. And by bringing our bodies to God, we mean the passions of the body, the abilities of the body. We mean even the appearance of the body. This is so critical for you to accept the raw material that God used to put you together and to thank God that you look the way you do. Many people look in the mirror and they wonder where God was when they were put together. What was he doing that afternoon? God gave us the bodies that we have. We can straighten them up. We can clean them up. But the fact is that for you to be able to say, this body was given to me by God, and I'm giving it as a living sacrifice to God. Because when God wants to act on earth, he works through our bodies, right? When we speak on behalf of God, we are using our mouths. When we listen to God's word, we are losing, I should say, we're using our ears. Uh, when we read God's word, we're using our eyes. And of course, if you are blind, you may be using your hands. But we are all using the members of our body. And we serve others with our hands and our feet. Now, we're in the text. Let's look at it more carefully, phrase by phrase. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. I want to go to the phrase, holy and acceptable. By holy, we mean holy spelled with an H, not a W, though the other would apply as well. And what we are to do now is to present our bodies holy and acceptable to God. And you and I know that we have tremendous passions in the body that work against that. We all struggle with that. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and I'm quoting the King James here, he says, I buffet my body. <laughs> Some of you didn't get that, actually. He said, I buffet my body. We tend to buffet it. <laughs> my translation now says, I discipline my body, which is exactly what Paul meant. Because even the Apostle Paul says, I have passions in my body, which if out of control, could destroy me and I could be a castaway. So what Paul is saying here is that when we yield ourselves to God, our motivation has to be his mercies, but what we must recognize is that we must constantly be giving our bodies to God, and we have a soul, Paul would say, we have a soul that can control the body so that we can have self-control. We don't need to do everything that the passions of the body urge us to do. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, Paul says we have to present our bodies to God, the members of our body, as instruments of righteousness rather than instruments of unrighteousness. And notice, he says, we are to be a living sacrifice. Let's look at that phrase for just a moment, a living sacrifice. Dead sacrifices are finished so far as God is concerned. No more animals need to be killed. The last dead sacrifice was Jesus dying on the cross for us to redeem us. After that, no more sacrifices are needed. All right? So, we are to be living sacrifices. Best example is Abraham. He's asked by God to kill his son, to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah. They walk for three days. They get to Mount Moriah. 
And when, the, when they get there and Abraham is willing to sacrifice his son, God says no. When they come down from the mountain after having offered the ram that was caught in the bushes, Isaac was now a living sacrifice. He was alive, but actually he had been sacrificed to God. What a wonderful example of what God wants from us. Living, yes, not dead, but sacrificed to God, dead to self, dead to our own ambitions, dead to our own ideas, dead to all the things that we think life should have offered us that did not offer us the things that we want because we are now alive to God, but everything about us is on that altar. And when we crawl off that altar that Paul is talking about, what we need to do is to reconfirm the fact that our bodies belong to God. That is the living sacrifice, which is our act of spiritual worship. Hang on to that idea because it'll become very important as we get near the end of this message. A second verse of scripture is that the service that we do for other people is worship. You know, that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 18. You'll notice he says, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. You may say, well, and the context, by the way, is serving other people, being sensitive to their needs, making sure that we are not a stumbling block to them, etc. You say, well, I don't see the word worship here. The word serve is sometimes translated worship because in the Greek text, it is the word that is used for spiritual worship to God. God says, when you serve others and you are sensitive to their needs and you are aware of what is happening in their lives, you are rendering worship to God. You begin to see how worship actually becomes a whole part of a, becomes a whole lifestyle, which is the point of this message, is that it isn't just simply limited to the time that we're together and we sing and we have wonderful music that takes us into God's presence, but worship, worship is a daily experience of God of laying our bodies on the altar, figuratively speaking, and serving other people, this is acceptable to God, the Apostle Paul says. By the way, and we don't have time, as I began to work on this message, I realized it should have been three or four messages, but we're going to hurry and we're going to put it all in. Chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says that evangelism is worship. He says, I'm serving others, I'm serving others with the stewardship, with the priesthood of the gospel, so that Gentiles might then serve and bring worship to God. So as we advance the gospel, we are also worshiping God. So serving others is a gift that we give him. Third, and that is by giving God praise and thanksgiving giving God praise and thanksgiving. In the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul is talking about Jesus who was crucified outside of Jerusalem. The reason it was necessary, this is Hebrews chapter 13, the reason it was necessary for Jesus to be crucified outside of Jerusalem is that's where the sin offering was taken. And when Jesus became the sin offering, he was crucified outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. So the book writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear his reproach to endure it. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. It's verbal praise 
and thanksgiving to God. It's thanksgiving because the Bible says in everything give thanks. Could I ask you a question? What do you think when you think of thanksgiving? Now I'm talking about the holiday of thanksgiving. What comes immediately to mind? Well, this isn't the kind of meeting where you can respond back to me, but you don't have to because I already know what you're thinking. You're thinking turkey, right? <laughs> Which leads me to the old question that I read somewhere that said, if a man is addicted to Thanksgiving dinners, can he quit cold turkey? You know that? <laughs> I'm saying that that's just what I read. The fact is, that's what we think. And so what we do is we say a quick prayer, we watch our favorite football team lose, and we call that Thanksgiving. I want you to hear this very carefully. Thanksgiving is a transforming experience. It changes everything. If you, in the midst of the most excruciating difficulty, in the midst of the greatest disappointment you could imagine, if you give thanks to God there, your whole perspective begins to change. I've noticed this. I've been through this. Your whole perspective begins to change, and you reaffirm your faith in God's sovereignty in that situation, and it takes a load off your shoulders. It puts that load on God, because you've given him praise and thanksgiving because the Bible says in every circumstance you give thanks. You don't give thanks for the sin, but you give thanks for the way in which God is going to use it. You give thanks for your difficulty. You give thanks for the challenges of life. And there's so much to be thankful for. Thankful, yes, so much to be thankful for. I woke up thanking God that I woke up. I mean, after all, there is another possibility, and that is to wake up somewhere else. And then you begin to think of all of the blessings of, of food and friends and relationships, and you begin to offer God thanksgiving, and immediately you realize God is in charge. I'm thinking of a, people who had an experience of their van being broken into. Can you imagine you have got all these presents and... The windows are smashed, and you go into the parking garage, and there it is. What do you do as a Christian? The first thing that you do is you bow and you give thanks to God. You don't give thanks for the thieves, but you give thanks to the fact that God allowed this to happen for your good, for his glory. He will see you through it, because in everything you give thanks. This past week, I read an awesome quote not sure who to attribute it to, but I want you to get this very clearly, clear, uh, carefully and clearly. Sometimes when our foundations are shaken, we think to ourselves, what shall we do? But when we call on God and begin to give him thanks, then we begin to realize it is God who is shaking our foundations. Imagine that. Thanksgiving changes everything. In the Old Testament, they had a Thanksgiving offering which was offered twice a day. God says, in the morning, you offer the Thanksgiving offering. In the evening, you offer the Thanksgiving offering. You offer it continually day by day. And that's the imagery here in the book of Hebrews that we offer that sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And that's something the Bible says, whoso offers praise glorifies me. You may say, well, I don't know how to glorify God. Well, there it is. Offer him praise and thanksgiving. And when your foundations are shaken and you begin to praise him, you realize it is God who is shaking your foundations and faith in his sovereignty is built into your heart. Now there's another gift that we should give to God. We've talked about our bodies, service to others. We think, for example, of the gift of praise that the Bible says we should offer. And that is um, the gift of giving. The gift of giving. 
You remember the words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians, and now I'm in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, Paul is thanking the people for their generosity. He's thanking the people at Philippi. He says, nobody else stood with me. Nobody else was really my partner in giving except you folks. And then he said this in verse 17. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. What Paul is saying is, it's not as if I, even if I didn't need the gift, I desire fruit that is to your credit. Paul realized something. Giving is not God's way to raise money. What an insult to the Almighty. He needs the money of the people of God to keep his affairs running in the world. I mean, doesn't that diminish God? It's not a matter of God raising funds. It's a matter of God raising saints who give out of their abundance and their poverty, who give showing their appreciation to the Almighty, who give therefore investing in the heavenly bank account, and as a result of that, learning something of the generosity of God. Blessed are those. Blessed are those who are generous. And Paul says it is fruit to your account. You know, in the Old Testament times, uh, God scolded the people for the way in which they gave to him. I'm thinking, for example, of the Italian Malachi, who wrote an Old Testament book. <laughs> actually, it's Malachi. It's actually Malachi. <laughs> this is what God says in Malachi. Maybe you should turn to that passage. It says, um, how have we despised your name? I'm in about verse 7 of chapter 1, Malachi. But you say, how have we polluted you? God is talking to the people about their offerings. He says, by offering polluted food on my altar. But you say, well, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And then he says, um, and when you offer those that are lame or sick, isn't that evil? Present that to your governor and see if he'll receive it. The people were, to at, were asked to bring their offerings to God. And so what they'd do is they'd look over the flock and they'd say, well, you know, there, there's some really good sheep here that are valuable to us, but here's one that's lame. It's probably going to die anyway. Why don't we give that one to God? Let's take that sacrifice to the priests. And so um, that's what they did. The blind, the Bible says, the lame, the sick, that's what they brought. And they thought, well, we're giving it to God. And so uh, that'll make do. God says, you're despising me. I don't want to get too specific about this, but I have a friend who I have heard has left the ministry. He was a pastor, and he left just because of sheer discouragement. He told me one day, he says, we have people in our church who will spend $50,000 on a new SUV, and he says maybe they give $1,000 to the church a year. He simply could not take the discouragement. Now, I will say this about the people at Moody Church. We thank God for your generosity. We thank God that there are many, many faithful givers. And even though we go through some rough patches and rough times, somehow in the end, we either make it or we come close to making it. And so I thank you in advance. But I'm simply saying how easy it is for us to give God things that really are leftovers. They don't matter much. And so, well, this'll do. God says, give that to your governor. Uh, give that to the IRS and see if they'll be happy with it. Paul says, I desire fruit for your account. And that's why. 
God asks us to be generous and to give. Now what I'd like to do is to nail this down for us because I promised you that I believe this could be a transforming message. Do you remember Copernicus? Copernicus came up with the idea which was revolutionary. Back to the days of Ptolemy, the idea was that the solar system revolved around the Earth. And there were so many equations, about 15 or 16 equations as I remember, to try to explain the movement of the stars with the Earth in the center. And it was Copernicus who said that we have to have a revolution in thinking. The Earth is not the center of the solar system, it is the Sun. And once he made that projection, a lot of other things fit into place. What I want us to do in the next few moments is to have a Copernican revolution. To see in our lives that it is not about us. It is all about the Sun, S-O-N, and our relationship with Him and to see a couple of things. First of all, that the purpose, the purpose of being saved, and that's good biblical terminology. I may be speaking to some here today who aren't saved, or you're listening in other ways and you aren't saved. That's the language of the Bible. But the purpose of being saved is to be a worshiper. Do you recall the story found in the fourth chapter of John's Gospel? Jesus is there and he's speaking to the woman at the well. Now she had had five husbands and was now living common law with a sixth man. It's very possible that the reason that she came out to the well at noon was because the other women, who normally went out early, didn't want to have a thing to do with her and she felt very rejected and very embarrassed. But Jesus is there and he gives one of the most blessed teachings on worship. Jesus is sitting there on the well and you know the story. I'm assuming that you know the details. But then when they have this discussion about worship, Jesus said, uh, you know, you say that we should worship here, the woman says, and Jews say that we should worship in Jerusalem. And then Jesus said this, the hour is coming and now is when it will not be here, nor in Jerusalem will they worship the Father. But the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. Now think about this. Jesus here is inviting this woman, undoubtedly despised in her village. How, what kind of a chance did she have to be a success? You know, sometimes people say today, oh, you know, you can be anything that you want to be. Well, I understand the motivation of trying to help people to get beyond themselves. But of course, that is absolutely foolish. You can't be anything you want to be. There are people who are locked into poverty. There are people who are locked into physical limitations. There are all kinds of reasons why you can't become everything that you quote, want to be. Many people cannot have success as we normally define it. But Jesus is saying to this woman, for whom success as we look at it is impossible, I'm seeking you as a worshiper. In fact, the Father seeks such to worship him. You can be a worshiper of the Almighty. And I say to you today that no matter who you are, no matter where you are in society or in your own problems or in your own spiritual need and overwhelmed by life, and you say, well, why should I even exist? I'll tell you exactly one reason why you should exist, and that is you have the pr privilege of worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and your whole life can be dedicated to him to be one of these worshipers whom the Father seeks. Will you remember that? That the purpose of life is to worship God. So if we think that the purpose of life is all about us, we have to remember that the purpose of life is all about God and us worshiping Him. There's a second lesson, and that is that worship, as we have looked at it today, 
We talked about the yielding of our bodies to God, the yielding of our finances, the yielding of our service and our adoration to God. Worship involves the surrender of ownership. Worship says, I am no longer my own. I belong to God. This body is God's. Worship says, I can't make all the decisions of life just around me. In fact, I need to yield to God and to seek His wisdom for the rest of my life. What a difference this makes. I remember speaking about this more than 30 years ago. Now, some of you may not even think that I'm that old, but I have been around for a while. And I remember later a woman, within a couple of weeks, received the dire news that she had cancer. And she said, Pastor, I was first of all overwhelmed until I realized who it is to whom this body belongs. The Bible says this, that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It belongs to God. It says that you do not have of your own. It belongs to the Almighty. And so what happens is, as happenstances take place in this world, we are constantly reminded that we are gods. The purpose of life is worship, and we refuse to hang on to things as if they are our own. It is the acknowledgement of the sovereignty of God over all of life. And that's why we wake up in the morning worshiping we go to bed at night worshiping, we worship all day, and then we come together with God's people, and we worship in a special way, corporately, because it's not about us. It's all about Him. It's about the Son of God. Let me give you a third lesson and a final one, and that is we are changed we are changed by the God whom we choose to worship. We are changed by the God whom we choose to worship. Let's suppose, for example, and everyone has an object that is most important to him. Worship basically means that we are committed to that which we value the most, and we give our attention to that. It's the kind of thing that happens when our minds are free, where do they go? Almost always to the object of our worship. So let's suppose that you choose money. That's your really object of worship. You will become stingy if money is your God. You will resent any opportunity to give. You will resent all of those invitations that we are given, especially at Christmas time, to give. You will, you will resent it all because it's yours. You feel that you have a right to it. And the God that you worship will have certain results. And you'll be a very stingy person. Let's suppose that your God is sexuality. And, and you're going to be involved in this because this is where the pleasure is, this is where the relationships are. You will become immoral. And not only that, you're going to live with a, with a defiled conscience and you're going to spend the rest of your life, the rest of your life trying to justify it and to hold down the guilt and to manage it as best you can. If you're a narcissist, you know that your whole life will revolve around you. It's all about you. And, and it's what other people think about you. It's, it's the jealousies that other people have more than you or they're better looking than you or more opportunities than you. You'll be very, very ungrateful because after all, it'll be about you. If we have God as the object of our worship, and I think it was C.S. Lewis said, who said that God is our most satisfying object. Hope I got that quote right. But once we acknowledge God as the object of worship, 
We become forgiving people because he's forgiven us. We become merciful people because he's had mercy upon us. We begin to learn to love others because the Bible says that even God loves those who are opposed to him. We even learn to love our enemies because we become like the God whom we worship. But if we can just change our attitude, our whole perspective, and make our whole life about God and not about us, relieves us of so much anxiety, relieves us of so much pressure to conform, relieves us of all kinds of things, because in the end, it's not about us. It's all about him. And he's seeking worshipers. I wonder if he's finding some today in this large audience. Is he finding some? What about those of you listening on radio or the internet? Is he finding the worshipers that he seeks? Remember this. You can bring honor and glory to God, no matter who you are, if you become a worshiper. And remember this. You may say, well, Pastor Lutzer, I worship God in my own way. Well, if you say that to me, I'd like to have a dialogue with you to better understand what you mean. If you mean you're coming to your God in your way and trying to bypass Jesus, you're, you're mistaken. Because Jesus taught that no man really honors the Father unless we honor the Son. And if we honor the Son and we honor God, that is to say we worship the Son, at that point we also honor the Father because they are inseparable. Let me say it with clarity. You can't get to God without Jesus. Remember that. <laughs> True worship begins accepting what he did for us on the cross, receiving his forgiveness and his mercies. And then, as Paul put it, I urge you by the mercy of God, you present, you give, you give your body, you give your time, you give your witness, your service, your financial situation. It's all about him. Isn't that great? It's all about him and not about us. Sure takes a lot of pressure off of me. I hope it takes the pressure off of you too. And in return, you are blessed by his presence. And there's nothing more valuable than that. Father, we are so self-centered. Forgive us. Help us to realize that we are the offering. Help us to not hold anything back. All of the excuses that we make. Come to us, O oh Lord God, we pray. Show us your glory. Help us to bring praise to you, because whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And may it not just be our lips, but our hearts, our bodies, and all that we have. Show us that it's all about you and not about us. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You're watching Pastor Lutzer on Moody Church Media. If you enjoyed this and would like to hear additional teaching from God's Word, Please subscribe to this channel or visit our website at moodymedia.org. May God bless you richly.